Hello my dear friends, what a treat I have in store for you today. I had yet another hospital visit. Do you remember the one I the uh, video I did some years, about two or three years ago, of my fall under the car? Well this is, this is not quite, well it is dramatic, but it's, it's a strange story. You know I had a little stroke about, what, three months ago, actually two months ago. Well I, I was I had a thought well, I was working with it okay as you know and then last night last night which is quite a new video I had this dreadful thing happen to me that was on my computer and suddenly my right hand went completely numb well I'm you know I live on my own here and I, I I panicked I did panic I went into anxiety mode and so uh, the story follows on from that particular instance that's led into strange waters indeed. The thing is, when I when I go to these hospitals, you know, I find it very difficult because there's all sorts of very strange people there. <laughs> You've got to be really a people watcher and, and, and sort of come through it that way. And I suddenly realised I was having a rage this morning, so fed it was at all, because I've had a phone call from Lincoln Hospital to say they want me back again for a referral. Why? It's been dealt with as a small thing, da da da. And the nurse is very sweet and they want to check your neck with an x ray and we want to check something else with this, see a consultant. I thought, What's it all about? Why is it got suddenly so intense? I mean, the things you can see the consultants about, you know, and I'm thinking this tiny event, really. So I got right into a real rage. I was really angry this morning. I think, what is going on? So I sat and thought about it. I thought, hang on a minute. I could change this around. I think I read somewhere that Dalai Lama does this with his Indian problems. He decided to change it around and make it into a positive experience, saying he was going into new adventures and having a good time and all that business. So I, I, I think I, I realised I do that. I did have quite a good day actually. <laughs> That's why I could talk to you about it. It's not a sort of a do or death experience, you know, although it could be. I just felt I was like I had a, I have this ability and it's obviously quite a gift. I think it's cognitive therapy where you take a situation and you turn it around into a more positive one which is more helpful to you. I'm just gonna check the moment the video a moment. Oh yes, we're still going. And I thought, gosh, wow, what a gift, you know. And I think these thoughts came from other places in my, you know, but they were actually into something that I already do. I thought, well, that's what I do. I turn on this, I have an actress mode, as I call it, which I probably use here as well. You know, not, not the, the miserable, no, I'm not miserable, but it's a certain, a certain gift I have to turn something positive into something more negative, which I do for myself as well. And I'm getting better at it. It is practice, but it's it's actually sort of turning things around. And so you come out a victor rather than a victim. <laughs> and this is what I do. And I thought, gosh, that's a gift, you know, to my I think somebody once called me a stand up, stand up comedian. I am good at making people laugh in the direst moments. You've got to be careful, mind you, because you could choose the wrong people. So this is what I was doing. So um, the, the story is about how 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 I got there. Well, first of all, I was in a panic about this hand. I thought I, I went. My heart was racing. I thought, oh, everything's happening. This could be anxiety attack. Could be. So what shall I do? And I thought, well, I've got to ring somebody. I rang the next door neighbour, and she she I don't know her terribly well, but I did actually ring for an ambulance. I thought, well, they better come and just check it out. If it's what it is, is what it is. You know. And the stroke but I didn't feel it was that I thought this was anxiety as a result of something else so I did panic I did panic and I went and got this ambulance which I really perhaps would have been better not to have done because they're very thorough these chaps are delightful they're lovely they, they're very thorough they used to make every note they take every detail so of course they present all this work to the doctor in the hospital is wow this is wonderful forgetting that it's already happened six months ago not six six weeks ago i just realized that so why is it getting so intense i've got a lot of new information that my local doctor didn't have so so i've set myself up a, a huge hornet's nest as you might say they were very thorough very good and very accurate you know so i've, I've got a 
if you please. And I thought, well, maybe this, my thoughts were maybe this visit, to the second visit to Lincoln, the big hospital, having an x-ray and seeing a consultant. I mean, it could, it could be helpful, could be useful, could be fun. Meeting new people and, you know, having an insight into the condition and someone's going to take me. I've got one of the local drivers, I have to pay him, but he'll take me. It's a 25 mile drive, quite a long drive, and then it's a walking through the corridors, which I can't do at the moment. So it's going to, it's going to be fun. <laughs> so this takes me back to the present time, which was yesterday. And, you know, I got to the hospital. Obviously, the guys, the ambulance men came, and they're very chatty and very friendly. One I'd seen before, I remembered his blood group. He was quite impressed. <laughs> so they took me in the ambulance to the hospital at I think about seven o'clock in the evening. Bearable time, you know. I packed a piece of quiche in my bag, and a biscuit or two and a jumper, you know, ready for the day, you know. <laughs> and we got there about seven o'clock and they park in the, the car park, the ambulance car park, and sit there for a while while they make their notes. And then you get driven into the main entrance where you you sit there for a while, they take you to stand. You know, it's one of these, like, journeys to end up in the inner sanctum of the hospital, A&E. Well, I think you might remember from the past video, it was a bit of a nightmare, that one. This one was probably even worse. It wasn't as busy because it was later, of course, and we got there about eight o'clock. I sat in this wheelchair in the, with all these people, you know. All sorts, all sizes, some of them half asleep, some of them half drugs, you know, they were, I thought, here we go again, people watching, how long will I be here for? And I see a sign on the side saying, six hours to wait to see a doctor. Six hours? Six hours? <laughs> oh, I might just make it, I got my bit of flan and my, you know, whatever. And so I found this seat and I got quite comfortable and I thought, oh, this is all right. There's a man next to me looked a little bit. He was obviously asleep and very, very, very old. That's another story. So I sat there for a while. I got the okay, cake, come around with the trolley with the coffees, you know, and I was nice that. Make your coffee. Lovely sandwiches. It was a really lovely cheese and salad sandwich. All set up, put the coffee on the chair. Next thing I do, this man next to me on the right, they're trying to wake him up. And I shouldn't, don't, don't worry that I'm laughing. I'm just laughing at the situation, not the actual, you know. It's, 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 a, it's a, I'm making a sort of joy out of it. They, they couldn't wake him up. So eventually the, the, the nurses gather, there's more and more suddenly. There was a crisis, you know. Somebody took my coffee away, snatched my sandwich out of my hand and moved me somewhere else out of the way because they were going to put screens all around this poor man. And they began bumping his, you know, they got him on the floor and there's all these nurses and people all doing this thing and I was down in the room. I couldn't see properly, but they had the screens around him. Obviously it was a serious thing, a serious situation. I don't know what happened to him, but I did see him being put onto a trolley. So whether he was a corpse or a body, I don't know. But at that point I thought, and I, I have some very strange thoughts on this, so don't worry. I thought, let him go. <laughs> you know, he must be in his 90s. How much longer was he going to have his heart pumped to keep him alive? You know, let him go, you know. And this is the very esoteric thinking. And it's, it could sound unkind to somebody who's got somebody who doesn't want to be let go. But that's the way I was seeing it at that point. He was already asleep. Why not just let him? Anyway, off he went, and I, had, and I couldn't buy a new coffee. They were all so in such a state. Oh, we'll get you a coffee later. They were all panicking about this thing. So I had to move to a new seat. It's very hard finding seats, actually, because they'll soon get full up, and you have to find a spare one next to somebody you think is okay. Well, the one I found this time wasn't too, too okay. The man, he sank heavily a drink. He did, really. He was a bit strange. So, and he kept trying to put his elbow, you know. Oh, God, you know, just, we'll sit it out for a bit longer. Then I saw a girl across the way. She was obviously in a state, and she was having 
she had things on her fingers and they kept coming to check on her. I thought something's going on and I thought, do I interfere? It's very tempting when you're, I'm not wouldn't say I'm a healer, but I'd like to help, you know. And so I thought, well, should I go over and see if she's okay? I thought, don't interfere, keep quiet. And then a very nice young man came up and was sort of helping her and chatting to her. I thought, oh, she's improved a bit now. But no, she was still in distress. So eventually I kept looking across at her and you know, I thought, maybe just make a, make a link somehow. And I did eventually go across to her. I said, I've been watching you. And she laughed, you know. I said, you having a panic attack? I don't know, she said, my blood pressure is very high. I said, what you can do for that is really, really deep breathing, slow, deep breathing, calm it down. Yeah. Oh, where did I get that from? <laughs> I wish I could remember that for me when I get in a state. And there I was calming down this girl and she did actually try it. And she began to perk up. She began to smile a bit more, you know, and she got herself a coffee and I thought, gosh, that's really lovely. I've just actually helped somebody without too much fuss, you know. And so that was quite a positive on, on my part. So on went the evening at 9 o'clock, 10 o'clock, 11 o'clock, still no doctor. <laughs> then I came across a very nice couple. She was she had a mood on her leg that I knew was in trouble. It was weeping quite a lot. We had a little chat. 91. She was 91. Very interesting lady. So we had a little chat. Then I kind of saw somebody else across the way and she was... She had a husband who had a very bad leg as well. And they were talking to some chap that actually seemed to come from my area, Horncastle. And I thought, well, what if we share a taxi home? Because with these hospital visits, you've got to find your way home. They don't send you with the with ambulance, not while you're on night with chap on the bed. <laughs> well, they wouldn't send him home, would they? So I had to find my way home. And taxis are very expensive. It's a 25 mile drive. It's usually about 50 pounds. So I thought, well, he might share a taxi. So I thought, dare I ask him? I didn't know who he was. So I must have might look good that day. I did look good. I had my lovely outfit on and I felt really good. I was the kid, you know. So I went up to him and asked him. He was quite receptive to be honest. Said, well, I don't live in Horncastle, I live just outside, so we could share a taxi. And yeah, but you might not have been seen by the time I have because you know you might but anyway, we we did have a little chat and um <laughs> agreed to share a taxi. <laughs> And I know, so I found another coffee, but I couldn't find another sandwich. So on this went, and um, people come and go, you know, and you it's, it's, you think, what's wrong with them? How, how are they here? But you never see, I said this last time, there was probably three or four rows of people. You never see any doctors coming in. You never see anybody doing anything. It's just all these nurses taking temperatures and measuring blood pressures and but nobody it seems to be seeing anybody and it was such a strange and yet when you did see somebody I thought that was very odd you know, you could sell you could almost smell the authority they walked differently they had a it wasn't a uniform it was just some, the ambience about this person that was coming into our midst you know with the great power and the authority but he's a doctor you know, they didn't come in very often. They came with a piece of paper, they read out somebody's name. You couldn't really hear it, but they read it out and you had to sort of listen, you know, and then get jump up and go and see this doctor. And then mine came and um, about, I think about 12 o'clock. Honestly, I don't know how, I don't know how I do it because I get, I do get bored very quickly. And there was no, obviously no television in this in the room no radio there was nothing at all except just finding someone to talk to and people are very receptive generally i did pick one or two that more or less told me to bugger off you know but generally if someone's gonna you know you think they you just you give them a bit of a lift a bit of a cheer up make a little joke you know it's an art to it and i managed to do it by the end of the evening i had several people helping me up on my chair at least three or four, put their arms out, you know. I thought, oh, I've arrived at fame. <laughs> so where was I now with this doctor? Oh, he was, they're, they're nearly all black doctors, you know. I don't, I don't know why that is, but he was a delight. Went to his little room. It was quite a walk down a corridor, so he had to help me. Because I'm, at the minute, I'm struggling. I don't know what's wrong with my legs, but I'm out of balance, and, you know. So I don't, can't walk very far, so he helped me. Got, and he was so efficient. I mean, it's lovely to see somebody with a skill, isn't it? I mean, so many doctors don't 
I know why they don't use it, but they're so busy and they don't have time to really explore things. They don't talk to you, that's for sure. And he was writing. I thought, I wonder why he's not using his computer, handwriting very quickly as I was talking to him about the situation. I, I, and you know what I'm like, I can't take over a bit. <laughs> I said, I don't, I don't think it's, I don't think it's, I think it's anxiety and it could be this. And, and he was writing it all down. <laughs> and it took me back to the to waiting room. He said, now you have to wait for the results. Another couple of hours, time for a coffee and a chat. By which time this woman's leg was really weeping, and I had to get a nurse and said, "Could you, could you dress it? You know, oh, so it's being seen to." Oh. So anyway, she did get, eventually get seen to, and then we had another crisis. <laughs> God, we gotta go. It's, oh, I have to be very quick. The other crisis was uh, next to me and this lady I'd met. And we, this man came in in his dressing gown. I don't think people do. Next thing we know, he's on the floor, sleeping with his hands on his... And we thought, what's up there? Next thing you know, screams are pulled around and nurses are flurrying around and paper cuts flowing and paper flowing and clothes and mops. And we didn't know, we didn't want to like to ask what was happening, but something had ever happened to him. He was now having a bowel release or something had happened because they were all round him and they couldn't get him off the floor. I mean, you're tempted to laugh really at this point because it is, it's really quite peculiar. And this lady who's 91 and myself, we got really started for a giggle because we didn't know what was going on. And I thought, we've got to know what's going on. We had to really look underneath it. And then surprisingly, my daughter waving his Mrs. Summers, Barbara Summers. <laughs> and he gave me all this information which I didn't really want to know about. He said, I've got a prescription for you for all these tablets to take to prevent a further stroke. I've already got tablets, I'm not taking them. I want to take, don't want to take them. So I, I've got myself in a bit of a mess here. So anyway, he's got this, I've got the prescription. And I had to go to the desk, you know, see my words are going, the desk where the reception to book a taxi to get home. One o'clock in the morning. No, it's not, it's more than that. It is about four o'clock in the morning. And I had to book this taxi, which cost me about 30, 40 quid, which wasn't too bad. This very, very nice chatty man to drop me off at my home. It's about five o'clock. There you go. Some story. I better go because we're running out of time. So enjoy it, darlings. Enjoy it. Next time you go somewhere you don't want to go or having to face something you don't want to face, remember, switch it around to make it into a fun project. <laughs> Takes a bit of practice. God bless.